we've all heard of the infamous 6502 processor, and its most modern variant is the W65C02. And yeah, that has been covered very well in other YouTube channels, but what hasn't been covered very well is the 65C816. This is also manufactured by Western Design Center, but it acts a little bit differently from the 65C02. And throughout the series, I'll be explaining the diff differences and how we can make a system board out of the 65C816. So I've got three breadboards here, which hopefully should be enough. And uh, we're going to plug the 65C816 on the middle of the breadboard. The first pin is vector pull. This is an output pin, just like on the 6502, so we don't need to care about this. The next pin is the ready pin. Just like the 6502, this is used to signal the microprocessor that it's ready to execute instructions. For now, we're going to tie that high. So that means the processor is ready to execute instructions. The next pin is a board, and they actually did a little typo here. They forgot the B, so this is an inverting input. And we don't want it to trigger an abort right now, so I'm going to tie it high using a 1K resistor. The next pin is IRQB. Just like the 6502, this is used to signal an interrupt. And by doing this, we can, tie, uh, we can set the pin low, and this will trigger an interrupt if the processor allows it. But for now, we're just going to tie that high because we don't want to be triggering any interrupts that we don't want. The next pin is MLB, or memory lock. This is an output pin, and we don't need to care about this. The next pin is NMIB, or non maskable interrupt request. This is an inverting input, but for our purposes right now, we can just tie that high using a 1K resistor as well. The next pin is VEDA program address. This is very useful for, for some projects that you might need it for, because this is used to signal other peripherals that the address is actually valid. But for now, we don't really need it because we can just do some timing calculation. That's an output pin. And then the next pin is VDD. So this is our positive power input supply. And then for our next 12 pins, we have the first 12 address lines. These are used to signal to other peripherals what address the microprocessor is addressing, basically. And these are all output pins. Pin 21 is VSS. This is a positive, uh, this is the negative uh, power supply in or zero volts so we're just gonna tie that to ground and then the next four pins are the upper four address lines and again these are all outputs so we don't need them yet but they'll be useful for monitoring the next eight pins are the data lines just like the 6502 however the upper eight address lines are also multiplexed in here and we will need to be able to sort this out so we're just gonna leave those alone for now pin 34 is read write just like the 6502, this is used to signal to other peripherals that it's either reading or writing. Pin 35 is E. This is the output for the emulation flag in the processor programming model. And uh, yeah, this 65C816, remember, it's an 8 or 16-bit microprocessor. And uh, in order to use a 16-bit, we need to clear emulation. Because in default, this is emulating a 6502. And so pin 35 is just an output signal of that flag. We could connect some LEDs to it if we wanted to. Pin 36 is bus enable. So what that does is if bus enable is tied high, the address lines and the data lines will be able to output data. And that's crucial for us. So we need to tie that high. The next pin is PHI2, which is a clock input. But for now, I'm going to leave that empty because we're going to design our own clock out of a 555. The next pin is MX. This is actually a multiplex of two flags in the processor programming model. This is the, uh, the M and X flags, which can be found. Let's see which page of the data sheet. Dun, 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 dun. No, not here. Also not here. No, not here. Come on. Two hours later. Right here. So the M is the memory select. So this basically means uh, we're either addressing 8-bit memory or 16-bit memory. So 1 is 8-bit and 0 is 16-bit. But 
we'll, we'll care about that later. Index registers select is for the X and Y registers, and that basically says, okay, these registers, do they need to be 8-bit, or do they need to be 16-bit? But on this particular pin on the microprocessor, this is an output pin. So, we don't really need to care about that unless we need it for some debugging. The next pin is VDA. This is the readly data address pin, and this is only signaled when the data bus is valid. Actually, we can find a more detailed table of this on the another page of the data sheet, which is right here. Valid data address and valid program address. So these are what this means, and you, we, we will refer to that later. Go back to the pin off here. Okay, the final pin is reset. Just like the 6502, we need some way of resetting the microprocessor. So what I'll do is add a button. And so what I've done is added a button and added a 1K resistor that ties the reset pin to 5 volt and only shorts the resistor to ground when the button is pushed. And remember, we're not done yet. We still need to add the clock, which I neglected earlier. So we're going to use a 555 timer. There we go. Now I've connected the clock input to the clock output of the 555. So now we should have a nice clock that's running our microprocessor. So now we're ready to execute some code. However, remember, the data bus is multiplexed with the address lines. So how do we figure this out? Well, the first step is to look at the timing diagram. So let me just flip to page 28. So yeah, I've made some notes here to make it easier to understand. And also they've included some key times uh, so that we can better make sense of what's going on. So when the clock goes low, the processor reads data. When the clock goes high, the processor writes data after a specific amount of time. In this case, it's going to be less than or equal to 30 nanoseconds. But when are the bank address lines available? Well, that's when the clock is high. So we could actually have two separate chips here. We can use a 574, which is a octo D latch, to latch the bank address. And then we could use a 74 LS245 and we could connect its output to the inverter clock. Why? Well, look at this. When the clock goes high, the data needs to be able to pass through from the microprocessor to other peripherals. So we can just do that by inverting the clock here. Well, that's because the output enable of the 34 LS245 is inverted. So that will match perfectly with this. So what's going on here is when we add the 245, the data is going to able to go from one bus to the other when the clock is high. But hold up, the microprocessor reads data when the clock is low. But don't worry, because the read occurs right when the clock goes low. So actually, we could have the 74LS245 uh, have its bus enable the whole way up until the point where the clock goes low. Well, that be that's because the 245 also has a propagation delay from OE to the, the data on the bus that's available. And that time is 25 nanoseconds. So if we just do it when the clock goes low, the microprocessor is not going to be able to read the data. That is something we really need to take into account, because if that problem is not accounted for, then the microprocessor will never work when, like we want it to. So having the inverter clock feeding into the OE input of the 245 makes everything perfect, because remember, we have this entire access time up until the point where the, the clock is low before the address changes. So. The ROM is going to have adequate time to set up that data and let it pass through to the read data. So how do we control the direction of the data bus? 
Well, there's a DRR pin on the 74 LS245, and we can connect that straight to read write. Why? Well, because write goes high when we want to write data, and then write goes low when we want to read data. And that could just be connected to DIR pin, and then we have the correct buses in the right directions. So let's hook that up. Okay, so I actually moved the clock area up here so I had a little bit more space to connect some more components. So now we're just going to connect our 245, which I'm going to connect right here. You don't have to use the DM245, you can use any model, but for my purposes, it's fine. And then we also need to connect to 574. Actually, let's put it here. And don't forget, we also need our inverter. So for our best purposes, I'm just going to use the 74 LS04 because, well, it has six inverters. And it's the best thing I have in hand at the moment. So let's just put that right here. So these are all the chips that are needed to populate the bank's address and also the data demultiplexing section. And after that's connected, we can move on to the next step. So now we have the data bus available and also the bank address available over here. Now I did have to move around things a little bit to make everything more elegant, but everything should work well like this. The next step will be to actually start programming the computer. And just like Ben Eater's first video, we're going to attempt to tie the data bus to the opcode EA, which is no op. So we're just going to do that. And so pretty much what I've done here is I've added some 1K resistors that help us tie the data bus to what we want it to. Now the reason I chose EA is, first of all, it's a no-op, and it also is a very good indication. So we know that for sure, everything is working well. So I've tied the data pins on the 74 LS245, yeah I use the DM1, uh, to the 01010111, which is EA in binary. So after we power this computer, Hopefully, we can get this to, I guess, successfully doing nothing for now. But it is a very good indication to make sure that everything is working fine. And then, we can step up into more difficult stuff. So I'm going to use an Arduino Mega to monitor the CPU's actions. So I'm just going to connect the uh, address bus to the Arduino input pins, and then the data bus as well, and then also the bank address, just to have a little bit of fun. And 32 wires later, I have now wired up everything from the CPU to the Arduino. The first 16 lines over here are for the address, the next 8 for the data bus, and then the next 8 for the bank address. So now all we need to do is plug our uploading cable in and write some code for it. So just like Ben Eater's video, I'm going to be using a similar 6502 monitor, but I'm going to make some changes. And remember, this, this is just a disclaimer, I'm just doing this the way I prefer it the most. So if you have any suggestions in the comments, do let me know. But please, please, please do not shout at your screen like, Oh my god, you did this wrong, or whatever, whatever. I'm just doing it the way that is most comfortable for me. Okay, so I've written some code here that mimics the 6502 monitor that Ben Nieter used, but instead it also monitors the bank address, which is all the way down here. And uh, yeah, most of the other functions are also the same, monitors the read write, and then monitors the data bus and the address bus. And if we look at the serial monitor here, we can see it's just behaving just like we want it to. You can see that it's counting addresses. And yeah, that's expected because the EA no op instruction is using the implied addressing mode and it only t should take two si clock cycles before it moves on to the next instruction, which like we hard coded is just EA. So we can claim our victory here and we can move on to the next part, which is starting to code something a little bit more advanced with this computer.